service today. Turn the volume up. Let's worship again. Yeah. Come on, church, help us sing. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. Morning, everybody. Welcome back, my Dude, brother. Dude, you gave me a hard time last week. I, you heard Like, it. somebody sleeps in one time, and you just announce it in front of everybody. Allegedly. Allegedly. So, just so you know, I was here super early this morning. I was here before every, well, almost everybody else. I was here for the band, before all the volunteers. It was just me and one brother here. As a matter of fact, I took proof picture. Y'all check it out. It was just me and him. We was chilling. <laughs> just chilling. He was unusually quiet, though. Unusually quiet. I like what he did there, man. He comes back with humor, nice and safe, no cancel. Nicely done. <laughs> if you are a first-time guest here, 
We hope you've not been here that long today, but we are glad you're here. Whether you're here on campus or you're joining us online, we want to know this the first time that you've been here. So let us know by texting the word guest to uh, our info number, 336-396-6861. All we're going to do is shoot you back a link to a free resource that is digital and will help you and your family grow spiritually. Absolutely, and while you're here today, if a part of your worship you are interested in giving, you can do so at our giving kiosk located out in the lobby or in the back of the gym. If you're cash or check, you can give with the ushers as you leave uh, this afternoon, and then if you're watching online, uh, or if you're interested in giving online, you can do so at our website, osbornbaptist.com. I I get it. We're all here from different places in life, got different things going on in our lives. Prayer is something that our church really values, and one of the things that I love most about our church right now, as a matter of fact, there is a team praying for us in service right now. And throughout the week, we know stuff comes up, some prayer requests comes up. And so if you have uh, osbornbaptist.com or the mobile app, you can submit your prayer requests throughout the week. And somebody individually takes time to pray for whatever you submit. One of the things we've seen over the last year through our prayer requests and our, our care ministry, man, the enemy is in full on assault to the body, and what he wants to do is divide us and isolate us. He wants to get us alone so we can start having those conversations with ourselves. But there's a principle that we know is true in your walk with Jesus. When you connect relationally, you grow spiritually. And that's why we have a ministry that we call Connection Groups. So we are getting ready to begin our winter connection group term. It starts two weeks from today, February the 7th, and it lasts until Easter. Now, all over campus, there are these red group finders. You can find out about all our groups on our digital group finder, osbornbaptist.com slash groups. Check out all of our available groups and get plugged into a group. Now, we get it. With covid Our groups are just as uh, diverse as they always have been. Some groups are going to meet virtually. Uh, Some groups will be in masks. Just all kinds of stuff, and you'll find all that information on our group finder. But you have to get plugged into a group. Let's connect relationally, grow spiritually, while the culture around us is dividing And we're becoming more isolated. It's really hard not to get plugged into a group here. I was super nervous. I just got to be honest with you. The first time I signed up for a group, I didn't know what to expect. I grew up in a different style of church that we have here. I had one thing in mind, and and it was totally something else. I want you all to get just a little mental picture of what a group looks like. I took a picture at our last group. Uh, This was just a a classic example of, of what a group looks like. And that same strange, quiet guy, he was over there. He's plotting on something. There's I don't some know. people here that hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Some laughing? people are like, why are they laughing? I don't get it. What, what am I missing from the picture? It's okay. Everybody stand up, find somebody around you and say, where's Bernie? <laughs> There's a way back home for the wandering soul. There's a peaceful calm for the restless one. And if you're so far gone, you can't see the shore. Just lift your eyes and look to the Lord. Come on. Cause he's a Walking on the water, he'll calm your raging seas. No, you don't have to look no farther. He's the hope that you need. Oh, if your sails are torn and tattered, and the storm just won't cease, take hold of the hand of the Savior, because he's the anchor of peace. Oh, he's the anchor. I was breaking down at the end of my road when the sweetest sound silenced the noise. Oh, he's the prince of peace. The waves know his voice. So just lift your Come. 
storm just won't cease. Take hold of the hand of the Savior, cause he's the anchor of peace. Oh, he's the anchor of peace. Yes, I was far from the peaceful shore, falling to a hopeless floor. Oh, the wreckage of the fall, there was no way out. And I saw the lighthouse, I was sinking and I fell in your head. You put my feet back on dry land. Oh, now I'm so far to love me. Let's pray. God, we hear words like far from the peaceful shore, and, and it just, man, it feels like this past week in our lives, God. Some of us, God, it just feels like life has just landed on us this past week. Lord, I just pray that sometime throughout our time together today, we would be reminded of who you are and how great your love is for us. Even though the circumstances in life all around us uh, say otherwise, God, we know the truth and that you are truth. And Lord, it's just great to hold on to that. God, I pray for every situation that's represented in this room and watching online this morning, God, everything that's going on in our lives, Lord, help just clear all those things from mind just right now so we can hear from you, God. God, we are here this morning because we want to hear from your word. We want to be taught more about you, God. We want to be encouraged. And most of all, we just want to be reminded of how much you love us. Lord, we give you this time and we praise you for everything that happens here today. And we give you the glory for all of it, Lord. Help us over this next few moments to remember how worthy you are, God. You are the only one worthy to be praised. And we thank, uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to sing. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark will stop? Light from getting through we do. do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do It's all creation groaning it is. is a new creation coming Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is. Come 
we'll sing it together. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root in the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Oh, he's worthy, church. Come on. Yeah. Does the Father truly love us? Come on. Spirit move among us. Come on. He does. Yes, he does. And is Jesus our Messiah? Hold forever those he loves. He does. And does God intend to dwell again with us? Oh, come on. He does. See it. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of me? Come on, worship him, church. Come on, sing it together. Come on. Great to see you. All of y'all joining us at home, thank you so much for doing that. Look, I know, man, it, it, almost everybody in Rockingham County now, right, can say either I've had COVID or I know somebody who's had COVID. So we get it, man, and, and we thank you for joining us at home. Some of y'all, it has nothing to do with COVID. You just like sitting on the couch in your boxers, sipping on some coffee while you join us in church. But we're glad you're here, man. We're just glad everybody tunes in or shows up because... Man, the church gathering just matters in our life, doesn't it? 
Um, my uh, son-in-law, Daniel, a couple weeks ago, he started um, physical therapy school at Winston-Salem State University, and uh, he was telling me in one of his classes, there's a lab, and they actually have to work on a cadaver. And uh, so they break all the students up in groups, and they assign them a cadaver. And he said, so they're looking at their cadaver, and all they tell them about the cadaver is that it, uh, what their occupation was and how old they were. And <laughs> so they said, Daniel's cadaver was... Uh, 91 years old and was a pastor. And uh, so each group has to decide what to name their pastor. <laughs> so Daniel's group said, why don't we name him Steve? <laughs> Daniel said, man, I can't do that. I, I, I just can't do that. He told me, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, that has nothing to do with my sermon today. But I thought it was hilarious, and I just kind of wanted to share that with you. We're in week four of our series called Master, Who Do We Serve? No outline. If you're looking, where's my outline? Where's my outline? I don't get an outline. I mean, if you're freaking out about that a little bit, I no outline today because I'm not so much going to preach to you today as um, just want to share some things that are on my heart. Um, you, know, you know, everyone serves someone. The only question is, who do we serve? Who is our master? Some people um, serve another person, right? It happens all the time. Lots of people do it. Some people serve a lie, a false religion. Millions of people do it all over the world all the time. Lots of people do it. Some people serve stuff, right? Some people serve their own flesh, and pride. Lots of people do it. Some people serve money. Lots of people do it. You know, we can do all of that, and the truth is, um, we can still end up uh, laying on a stainless steel table with a bunch of students gathered around us, looking at our innards, trying to figure out what to name us. We can serve all kinds of things, but there's still going to be a day we take our last breath. There's only one life. It'll soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. You see, who we serve determines what our life is like now and for all eternity. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say. You know what Jesus is saying? I'm not really your master. Man, we've got to come to grips with that. Probably the clearest um, indicator of who is really our master is what we do with money. So last week we talked about, you know, who's master of our money, part one. This week, part two. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. In Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul gives us some real clear insight about how that plays out in life. Philippians 4, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. In other words, he was saying, man, I, need, I needed you to support this ministry. I needed you to send some money. Well, you didn't have an opportunity, but now you have some opportunity, and I'm grateful for that. He said, you were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need. Now, now look at this. For I have learned, that's a big word, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Boy, that, that's huge. I mean, imagine what life would be like if you were always content in every situation. That's not something that uh, is natural for us. In fact, it's very counterintuitive, but the Apostle Paul says it's something you can learn. Learn in whatever situation I am to be content. Verse 12 says... I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then he kind of closes that section of scripture by saying this. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Well, <clears throat> probably the area of our life that we are most uh, likely to be discontent is money and stuff. We, it's kind of hardwired. It's, I want more, I want more, I want more, and enough is never enough. Then we get it, then it gets old, then we need something else, then we want something new. Contentment is a little evasive. Um, Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. I mean, man, that stuff we're searching for, that stuff we're longing for, that stuff we got to have. I mean, you know where we really find it? In true godliness. That's great wealth. You, you see, ultimately, contentment is about one thing. Who is my master? Almost every area of life is driven by the master we serve. Um, when Jesus uh, is our master, when, when, when it's Jesus being our master that, that, that drives our life, it determines how we treat our spouse, how we react to our kids, how we act at work, how we handle money. So last week, we, we, we learned this. Until God's in control of our money, our money's in control of us. And there's a biblical model for giving. A, kind of the biblical model for giving is giving a percentage of our income to a healthy church we believe in. Giving a percentage of our income to a healthy church that we believe in. So, so what, what does that look like? Well, well it's, it's not complicated. It's actually pretty simple. God provides $10 for you. You give $1 to God. God provides $10 for you. You give $1 to God. You know, most of us go, Man, I can do that. I mean, one buck, man. You can't, you can't even buy anything with it. I, I can do that. Then it gets a little more complicated because then God gives us $100 and he says, give $10. You go, eh, you know, that's a Chick-fil-A gift card. Yeah, I could probably do that. I mean, yeah, not a big deal. Then God gives you $1,000. You give a, yeah, I mean. I, uh-huh. Then God gives you a living and a salary and it's thousands of dollars. And all of a sudden you go, uh, uh, I'll give God that gift card. Man, you see that? I gave that 10 bucks. Gets a little weird, doesn't it? Hey, if you ever have that dilemma in your life, please come see me. Because I, I want to pray for you. I got a specific player I want to pray. God, here's my brother or my sister. God, You have blessed them so much. You have provided so much for them in their lives. God, you have given them so much that now they can't afford to obey you. So, God, would you please take some of it away so that they can then afford to obey you once more? I'd love to pray that prayer. Wouldn't it be fun to pray that prayer? I hope somebody will do that. Now, so... The biblical model for giving that kind of reflects Jesus really is my master uh, is giving a percentage of our income to a healthy local church we believe in. So so what does a healthy local church look like? There's a real picture of it in Ephesians 4, verse 16. It says, "He he being Jesus, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, he helps other parts to grow so that the whole body, here it is, is healthy and growing and full of love. I mean, that's what a healthy church Looks like so when a church is healthy, it's growing. People are coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and growing in their faith. Uh, it, it is full of love. We're, we're loving Jesus and everybody else. And, and oh, by the way, next Sunday, um, I'm going to preach a straight up salvation sermon. If you have some friends, get them to your house, sip some coffee with them, watch it, bring them here. If you know a friend who needs to know Jesus, man, next Sunday's the Sunday to do it. But when a church is healthy, growing, and full of love, here's what you see. You see ministry happen everywhere. Everywhere you turn, ministry is going on. Um, 
Here's something really important I've learned in my life about God's economy. Money follows ministry. Giving follows ministry. So we start serving God. God always provides. Our God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Our God will always supply everything a healthy church needs to do ministry. It's always that way. Um, We do the ministry, God supplies the need. We do the ministry, God supplies the need. And he does it through the obedient heart of a giver. Now, I, I tell you, man, I know lots of churches around here who haven't done ministry in decades, but they got $500,000 in a bank. And they've had it for decades. Somewhere along the line, you know what they decided? They just made a decision. You know what? Uh, We got some money. Um, We're not going to really do ministry anymore. And then the, the measure of that church becomes, we got money, therefore we're healthy. But they're not doing any ministry. I mean... Man, dying on the vine, dead as a hammer, have half a meal in the bank. Man, I tell you, everything in me wants to get, hey, uh, would y'all mind giving us that money? Man, we'll put that money to work for the kingdom. But money always follows ministry. And ministry always begins with someone else's need. We, we don't do ministry for ourselves. Ministry always begins with somebody else's need. Everybody has a need for Jesus to be our Savior, right? That's why we're here. Everybody has a need to grow in their faith. That's why we're here. People have needs for food and for counseling and to, to grieve in a healthy way where they have some hope. I mean, we do all those ministries Because everybody has needs. It's the heart of who we are, and it's really kind of the heart of what I want to talk about today. Because there are two kinds of ministries. There is intervention ministry. It's emotional, and the results are measurable. I mean, we we have all kinds of ministries like that. When we feed people who don't have food, that's intervention ministry. There's a crisis in life, and we are intervening into that crisis. When people's marriages blow up, we intervene into that life crisis to help them in Jesus' name. So there's all kinds of life crises that pop up, and, and, and we as a church are here to do intervention ministry And it's measurable. We fed this many people this year. By the way, through our uh, Rockingham Hope Ministry, we gave out half a million pounds of food last year. I mean, let that number sink in a minute. It's emotional. Somebody's hungry. Give them food. And it's measurable. And there are all kind of intervention ministries that we do like that. Um, But there's also prevention ministry. It's not emotional. It's not measurable, but it's superior. You you see, we live in a world that um, almost totally prefers intervention over prevention in every area of life. Right? I mean, we do that with our health. Right? I mean, man, we don't eat right. We don't exercise. Instead of eating broccoli, we have double cheeseburgers with large fries. I heard some people do that. I can't say that but personally that that happens. But sometimes people eat double cheeseburgers and fries instead of healthy stuff. And then this and that. They don't exercise. Then all of a sudden, something's not working right. And what do we do, man? We go to the doctor for intervention. And what do we say? Hey, you got something to fix that? Right? Instead of doing what was necessary, we, we do it in almost every area of life. We do it in marriage. We get married. Somebody gives us a book 
about how to have a happy, happy marriage. We put it on the shelf. What the heck do I need that for? And we almost immediately begin unhealthy marriage habits that end up tanking our marriage. And what do we do? You show up at Pastor C's office and say, well, you fix him. Now I need intervention, right? We do it with our kids. All kinds of man mess in the world. And we're doing very little to prevent the impact of all of that mess on their lives. We're not sitting down and having conversations with them. We're not teaching them the Word of God. We're not praying with them on a regular basis. We're not showing them how to avoid holes in life. Then they fall in a hole. So what do I do? I bring them to church and say, fix them. I did nothing for for prevention. Now I need intervention. It happens in almost every area of life. It happens uh, in our walk with God, right? Right? Man, I don't do the things that are necessary to prevent me drifting from God. I'm not I, we, he, and I'm not practicing spiritual disciplines as an individual. I'm not in a group. I'm not worshiping on a regular basis. I'm not looking for ways to serve. And so I drift. And then what happens? Boom, life blows up and I need intervention, and I run to God and say, God, would you please help me? And God, of course, in his mercy and grace, will. But the truth is, almost all those issues could have been prevented. But because we didn't practice prevention, now we need intervention. And it's very true in our giving. Man, we love intervention giving, right? Giving to ministry that is emotional and measurable. I mean, you see a starving kid, man, you want to, and we should. It's a good thing. Intervene in that, right? Um, we, we, uh, uh, we take up We're up to like $53,000 now that we took for our new church plant in Los Chiles, Costa Rica. Praise the Lord, man. That is intervention ministry. We see a church. We see a need for a church. We see a village in Costa Rica that there's no church, that we've already been doing ministry. God raised up a, a man to go pastor that church from our church. They're going down there. Yeah, that's intervention ministry. Praise God. That is good and necessary. Prevention giving is better. Intervention giving can get that church started. Prevention giving, you know what that does? It makes sure it's healthy three years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. When the emotion and the immediate measurability of it is gone. Prevention giving is better. Intervention ministries are good and necessary. Prevention ministries are better. So so we got all of our Genesis ladies over here. Aren't you ladies grateful for the intervention ministry of Genesis that gets you out of an addiction lifestyle and shows you the grace of Jesus Christ? Aren't you thankful for that? Praise the Lord. Aren't you guys thankful for that? Aren't you glad to see him right here? Yeah, you bet. Now, let me ask you Genesis lady a question. Don't you wish a few years ago somebody would have been teaching you prevention and all the things you know now back then so you could have avoided the addiction altogether? That had been better, right? Big deal. You, you, you see, prevention giving is harder Prevention ministry is harder. You know why? It's not emotional. You know why it's not emotional? You can't measure what's been prevented. You can't measure what's been prevented. Almost all of what we do here in terms of ministry is prevention ministry. 
So we have a preschool ministry where we start with kids from birth, just a little bitty kids. And you know what we want to teach them before they get out of our preschool ministry? Jesus made me. Jesus loves me. Jesus wants to be my friend forever. We want them to know those three things beyond a shadow of a doubt. And then when they get older and they start questioning, does anybody love me? From the time they were this big, somebody was teaching them, Jesus loves you and he'll never stop. And then that spills over into our our OBC kids ministry. And it's in our OBC Kids Ministry where most kids in our church, that's where they come to know the Lord because we're telling them about Jesus. We're teaching them the Bible. They are understanding the fundamentals of the gospel. And it is a big deal. And even at a young age, they start to learn, when life goes south, Jesus is there to help me. And that spills over into our Switch Middle School ministry and our Collide High School ministry. And it is a big deal when, when, when they are tempted by life, but they are learning how to resist the temptations. When, when everything around them in life says, hey, try me. Hey, do this. Hey, it's gonna, you'll love it. Hey, nobody cares. Everybody's doing it. But they're learning. There's a price tag with that. And they learn how to resist the temptation of things that can put them in a hole. Man, that is a big deal. And when those high school and middle school teenagers, they, and they look around their life, and man, they are tempted to believe that the whole world revolves around them. Maybe all teenagers don't do that. My teenagers were always tempted to believe the whole world revolved around them. But you know what they learn in our Switch and Collide Ministries? They learn that Jesus is their master, and it's not about me. It's about him. And I'm learning how to humble myself under the mighty hand of my master and serve him for my whole life. And that spills over into our adult ministries where we're teaching people to I, we, he, and learn spiritual disciplines and, and get, learn how to do life with another group of people and, and, and engage in worship and take the gospel to the world. And you know what those prevention ministries do? They prevent families from splitting up. And there becomes this legacy. From generation to generation to generation. Of people who understand Jesus is their master. And we serve him and we live our life according to the Bible. Because that glorifies God and it benefits me. And I'll just be honest with you. my, My heart rejoices over the families that the ministries of this church prevent from splitting up. I believe it is a superior ministry. You know, you know why? Look, man, intervention ministries are amazing and good and necessary. But intervention ministries are always preceded by pain. And it thrills my soul, man, to see a family avoid the pain because of what's been prevented in their life. I'm going to tell you, man, when I walk with people through pain... When I see their anguish and grieve with them and hurt with them, the reality is not lost on me that almost all of this could have been prevented. You see... can't measure what's been prevented, but we see the effect of it 
all around us. Something pretty significant is going to begin this week. Uh, we're going to begin building a new building this week. You're going to start seeing some things happen and some things getting torn down. And, and the end result is going to be something like this. Um, this is a view of what the building will look like when we're done at the very front of the building. So there'll be new offices and new preschool and children's ministries and areas, and, and there'll be a, a cover that you can drive through uh, so parents of uh, preschoolers and children can drop off there. Um, it's a secure check-in. Go down to the new parking lot. Now, you know, it's all there for you. Here's another view. Um, uh, this is kind of the cafe side. You see the cafe there on the far right. So that's what the new front of the building will look like, those new ministry areas. And then here's a picture of what, what the back will look like. So, so you can see kind of where the loading dock is right there. So to the left there, that's all new worship space. And, and, and all of that is going to be uh, started this week. Now I need to tell you that because... Um, there's going to be some irritations that come with that. So relatively soon, you're not going to be able to enter the building on this way, or you're going to go enter on the side or this side. Um, there, there's no parking on the front. I mean, there's going to be some irritations for several months, uh, but it's all worth it because we're going to have something really important at the end. So, but here's a great question to bring up. Here's a great question. Why build a new building? I mean, why not just take all of that money and feed the poor? Why not just take all of that money and use it to intervene in people's lives who are in crisis? Because we could do that. Here's the answer. Because intervention ministry is necessary and good, Prevention ministry is superior. It's good and necessary uh, to help rescue kids in abusive homes. Would you guys agree with that? Man, if I said, hey, here are three kids, they're in an abusive home, and $500 can get them out and get them help, you think we could raise that today? In about a nanosecond, right? Because that is a good and necessary thing. But it's a better thing, it's a superior thing to create a home through the obedience to the Word of God where abuse never takes place in the first place. This building is a place where prevention ministry takes place. Here's another kind of obvious question we, we could ask. Why would we build a building in the middle of a pandemic? That is a great question. I mean, we don't need space right now, right? Why would we build a building in the middle of a pandemic? I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, I get it, though. It can seem a little screwy. I mean, why would... What? I've had those questions myself. A few weeks ago, I was reading through uh, the prophet Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, there's this uh, thing that happens. Now, up until chapter 32 in Jeremiah's life, Jeremiah basically had one message. Israel, you've disobeyed God. You're going to Babylon for 70 years. Israel, man, you turned your back on God. You dishonored God. You're going captive to Babylon for 70 years. Nothing's going to stop it. You better get ready. That's basically his message. And then in chapter 32, the Babylonians have come. Man, they have already built siege ramps up to Jerusalem, the city walls. And God says to Jeremiah, I want you to go buy this field. Like, what? I mean, God, that rent seat, rent, I mean, what? By, we're leaving? What? What? And then God says, why? This is my promise that my people are coming back. And I read that and I thought, okay, Lord. Hmm. Why 
build a building in the middle of a pandemic? Because people's needs are not going away. And they're going to come back. And when they come back, their needs are going to be greater. I mean, the reality is, someday soon, the pandemic is going to pass. And people will come out the other side with more needs than when they entered the pandemic. And this building is going to be a place where those needs get met. Mm. You know how we do that? We do that by teaching them to live according to God's word and to live as Jesus, as their master. In generations to come, in generations, our kids and our grandkids and their kids and their kids will worship in that building and they won't even know who we are. But they will be receiving the benefit of your obedience to God in your giving. You see, all these things are possible because you give. You know, man, I could get up here like a lot of pastors do and say, look, if you give a 10, God's going to give you a 100. And a lot of pastors gotten really rich doing that. Um, I, I don't think that's really a biblical idea. Um, and they, the truth is, they don't really believe that. Um, if they believed it, you know what they'd be doing? They'd be out in the parking lot every Sunday passing out hundred dollar bills. Hell, yeah, well now I'm going to get a thousand. Now I'm going to get a thousand. That's really not how God works. I could get up here. And I could plead. Oh, friends. Friends, things are tight. There's a pandemic going on. We need you to give. The money is disappearing. You know, I made up my mind a long time ago. I'm never, as long as I have breath as a pastor, going to stand in front of this church and say, oh, things are tight. Now, I unashamedly ask you and teach you to obey God with your money. But if things are tight, either we're not doing ministry or we're not obeying God with our money. I could get up here and guilt you. If you really love Jesus, you'd be given. And if you don't, he's going to get you. Look, I'm not up here to get something from you. I'm up here to give something to you. The assurance that when Jesus is the master of our money, He's going to do things you can't imagine. I'm really here today to stand up here to remind you why giving matters. And that Jesus is the hope of the world. He is our master. And when we obey our master in giving, we get to be a part of God shining the light of his hope in this church, in this county, in this world. So here's the challenge. Will you be a percentage giver to this healthy local church that you're a part of? So that other people can receive the hope of Jesus Christ here and all over the world. Pray with me.
Father, thank you for your great love for us. I thank you, God, for all my brothers and sisters here. We thank you, God, for all the ministry that takes place here. We are thankful, God, for intervention ministry that is necessary and helpful and good. God, we are more thankful for prevention ministries that help people not to fall into holes to begin with. God, we love you. And I am so thankful for this church and their generosity and the fact that they understand you are our master and we serve you. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and worship.
Hey, thank you so much for being a part of the service today, whether you were in the room or watching online. We want to remind you, you can click to give, click to pray. We want to know how we can pray for you. Hey, God is with you. He loves you. He's for you. God bless you. We hope to see you again next week.